Uh, welcome. My name is Mike Wilson. I'm the executive director of AIA East Bay, and we're happy to have on here tonight. Sure. Mr. Jersey is on the AIA board of directors and uh, quite passionate about building insulation. So having said that, um, the only announcement I have is please check out our calendar. We have literally hundreds of events this year. They will be here and across the whole bay. All lecture series going on. We've got a huge, a brand new lecture series, uh, design tours. We've got our uh, rebooted community, community on the environment. And the big news, A23, the AIA convention is coming to San Francisco in June. And if you're an AIA member, then you can get a fairly big discount because we're in California this year. So I want you to be on the lookout for that. And most important, uh, the AIA East Bay is hosting a architectural day tour. So that we, we've got three of them scheduled to probably sell out. So we'll um, add a couple more, but that will be a day tour where you'll go out from San Francisco, out around Treasure Island, underneath the Bay Bridge, up the Oakland Estuary and then back across downtown. So that big loop, we have seven speakers who will tell you about each point of interest and the reopen bars. So it should be quite a jolly education. Don't tell all of you. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not, we open bars. <laughs> so with that, uh, I'll thank my name. Oh, before you leave, um, we're really lucky to have Mike Wilson. Uh, here in, in the architectural community, running the running this ship incredibly well, and just opening up the whole thing. You know, I I wouldn't be on the board. If it wasn't so, thank you. Mike. There you go. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. So I'm Todd Jersey. I'm the principal founder of the architecture. A very small uh, architecture firm in Berkeley. Like we have the staff are here, um, and. Uh, I'm uh, I'm really mostly passionate about high performance construction. Uh, insulation, of course, is is a is a high performance wood frame construction insulation. Of course, is a is a big part of that. And welcome to all the online uh, participants as well. Uh, good. So let's just jump in. Um, oh, you guys probably want to know. We probably should just go ahead and. and, and and give, I should give you this little thing and we can pass this around if you want. Okay. But this is mineral fiber insulation. This is uh, fiber insulation. They were both soaked under water this morning. And we got a sponge. This one took on almost no water to begin with, so it was a big deal dried in about 20 minutes. This one's still well. The very important part of our little setup is here. Um, because if we're, if we're going to talk about high performance, we're going to, by association, we're going to be talking about low performance, <laughs> which is the opposite of high performance. So let's just jump in. Um, my glasses. Uh, okay. So, hey, Mike. Or is, hey, Mike. How do I? Got it. What do you mean? Maybe it's a touch pad. It's yeah. Ah. Thank you. That's the cursor. Okay. So you're higher. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So here's the why, right? The the, the question of why bother? Um we we don't really need to jump in and speak about this anymore whatsoever. Uh, but I did want to sort of start out with defining high performance because we use it as a buzzword and we're not really serious about buzzwords, right? I mean, that's just the brain's way of just categorizing something and just moving on. But, you know, I took the time um, to set this talk up to think about high performance. Uh, and I came up with a working definition I like, a construction material and or system that provides a particular job or service more effectively than a conventional material system. Pretty simple, right? Makes sense. Such systems must have, and, they, and, and these are these, this is now the uh, working definition as in, this is my standard. 
Such systems must have a reduced impact on the environment along with no little initial cost increase. So they have to be affordable. Uh, if it's not affordable, it won't be used. So it's not very high performance. While providing long-term operational savings, better job, less impact, less cost. Pretty good, right? You guys can steal all this stuff. So that's our, so that's, that's a high performance. That's just the high performance in general. So when we talk about high performance wood train construction or high performance insulation or a high performance uh, air and water barrier, high performance windows. Uh, and so definition of high performance insulation, insulation material and or system that creates an exterior envelope, which is greater thermal performance. Such a system shall provide greater interior comfort while reducing reliance on mechanical systems and ultimately saving energy and saving energy costs, right? Minimizing environmental impacts. So here's, and I have the, it's a little bit, well, I can actually I can move this down. Oh, actually, I actually can all have a little eight and a half by 11 sheet on this. So these are my, sort of my 12 concepts for choosing, rather than, you know, just taking my word for it, I thought I would give you guys the sort of principles involved in that I think, and obviously this is, you know, not set in stone or insulin or fiberglass. Uh, they, they, these are all working uh, in iterative processes, but the stuff that I think is important when you're going to collect uh, insulation systems. So, and so we'll just go through these uh, and then we'll do a little show and tell and have questions and then we'll be done. So number one, insulation, uh, let me share my picture. Number one, first concept, insulation as a material choice is more than an issue of energy savings. Uh, it relates directly and intimately to building integrity and fidelity. Great word, right? Fidelity. Remember high fidelity televisions? The ability of the project to do its job well and for sustained periods. The building performance and integrity issue in the wider sense of just thermal comfort. Uh, integrity, I'm defining it here. This is all, this is all, I mean, these are semantics, but this is, if we're serious about our job, this stuff is important. The quality of being honest, having strong moral principles, synonyms, honesty, probity, rectitude, honor, you get the point. Uh, Number two, and, I, and I'm not going to say more about that. That's pretty, it's just sort of a foundational principle. Number two, fiberglass insulation is, is so now we're going to talk about right. insulation and just my experience of working with insulation and some of the, some of the issues. I mean, there's a, if there's a theme here, is I want to introduce you and I want to keep you from specifying this and installing this stuff. And really have you focus on the class. And, and if you're not convinced by the end of this talk, you might have done a poor job. Not just a question. Yeah, please. Can you keep on the far end? Yeah. Can you hold up your, your props? Can you make sure that you're holding it in front of the camera? In front of, and this is the camera? Uh, all you just have to turn to it. And that's it? Yeah, there's someone that's standing. Okay. There's a person there. Yeah. Looks like an owl. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you have to talk to the owl. Okay, so so with that said, let's talk about the second concept in understanding and designing high performance insulation that I have here, which is that fiber back, fiberglass bat insulation is hydrophilic, acting as a water reservoir and should never be used in the construction, in such, especially in retrofits where the exterior waterproofing is suspect, right? Yeah, we have, have a lot of those. We all have a lot of those if we're in this in the residential industry where we're not really sure we open up an interior wall and we're putting in fiberglass insulation we really don't know what's going on with the waterproofing on the outside and this is the result you guys see me the, the, the result is pulling apart a wall that's insulated with fiberglass where you have stuff where you have water intrusion which a lot of walls do everybody's clear about that right buildings leak they either leak from the outside, or pipe leak, or what's another huge source of, of water to bring condensation. Right, so we we have water in our framework. What does fire? Do you guys pass around that little? Yeah. What what happens when 
fiberglass can be plastic. That's a really bad thing. It absorbs the water like a sponge. So it creates a reservoir, right? This is a mineral butterfly, why it doesn't absorb it. Right? So, and then it inhibits drying. So there's a really important building science concept about water damage. And it's deflection, drainage. Water's going to get back behind the siding. Got another drain off. Siding is deflection. Third one, the third D is drying. Any frame wall system that doesn't dry is going to rot. It's just such simple stuff, right? This stuff, and this is why this is why I never want to use this stuff ever again. Even if it looks kind of groovy, he goes brown. <laughs> it's the same. Thing. And, you know, not only does it lead to, to rot, you know, we're not really seeing the drive rot so much in the frame. Now you can kind of see it there. But what is this black stuff? Uh, yeah, I was like, oh, that's mold. That's, that is dangerous stuff. Okay, you scared yet? <laughs> I really want to scare you. Fiber, so fiberglass inhibits drying. That is precisely in, from the from a building site. So what, what's amazing too is that it, I hope you take away something interesting here. Building scientists are still using fiberglass. It just blows my mind. I have been, I looked into this. It was like use this stuff. <laughs> like wait a minute, this is the same stuff. Um, so th there's a there's a lag time here, and I'm not sure what that's all about. But true, you know. I consider myself pretty much a building science purist, and drying is crucial. This, this inhibits drying. This essentially promotes drying. It doesn't get doesn't, doesn't get wet. It doesn't hold water. So then, in the summertime, let's just say the summertime, we want, we want our frame wall system to dry out. Like right? just make, making it simple. It's not raining. Sun's baking on this thing. I'm I'm looking at the owl and showing the owl. That's it. Bye, guys. <laughs> You're being represented by a very cute looking thing. Um, this stuff doesn't get wet, doesn't hold water, it's not a sponge, therefore it's, just, it's not making the wall system work especially hard to try to dry out, right? This stuff is. This stuff that leads to that, this is stuff that does not lead to that condition. Okay, so it's a major, it's a major difference. So what I, obviously what I'm asserting is that this is significantly higher performing than this. But ending up. And this is the best you can get not. This is the best fiberglass made. It's more expensive than, than uh, John Van Bowen and all that stuff for a reason. It's better. Still don't use it. Okay, uh, concept four mineral fiber saves framing material. So this is this is kind of kind of neat. It's sort of had this, this brainstorm today on that. An R3, which is our, you know, if we're going to do vaulted ceiling construction, right? We're going to use, we're going to use R31, R30, and R4, wherever we can get it. The only reason we don't use R30 in walls is because our walls, we don't want to fill walls. But our roofs, right, for roofs and floors, those are bigger structural members, we're going to fill them full. An R30, who knows, who remembers, who knows what R30 and this how thick it is. And then quarter inches. I mean, what is that in terms of a frame size? That requires a two by 12, because two by 10 is nine and a quarter. This is a full inch thicker than, uh, than the two by 10. So our standard vaulted you know, framing is two by 12. This, seven and a quarter inches. So we can go to when we can, we can go to two by eight. And in our firm, we use a lot of two by eight here today. A lot. So, you know, this is so dramatic, obviously. There's, these don't even, these aren't even right, but it's a lot more wood. Uh, you're using a lot more framing material if we're sticking to this. Unintended consequence. Right, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. We're not thinking holistically and thinking in systems, and we're not thinking about this kind of stuff. But I already just, whatever small delta, and we'll get into what the cost delta is, I just 
out the window now. I just say five x that small delta in framing. Much more expensive material. Besides being lighter and faster, but labor and I mean, it's just right. Okay. Concept number five. This is my favorite. Going to mineral wall cost. Not mineral wall cost. Nothing. I did the numbers. We'll look at this little chart later on. It, it runs to about a dollar to two dollars square foot extra. So we're building that. What are we building now, Frank? 400 to 500 to 600 dollars a square foot. You're, you're high end. So. Um, <laughs> I mean, for a Frank project, this, this is chump jam. It's not, can't even, doesn't even register. We're talking about for a thousand dollars. That is 0.1% increase in, in the cost. 0.1%. So we're not even, we haven't even, we're not even registering at this point. Insignificant chump change. This was, I found this out today in the under Google. This is cool. Chump change is a term coined by the African American community in the mid 60s. And at Berkeley, I learned this term at Berkeley High School in the mid 70s. I love this term. The stuff you learn. Okay. Um, I also started thinking about acoustical because I love the little And every time I do work on this, these kinds of things, I, it, it blows my mind what a superior product this is. So I go down. This is a picture at uh, Ashby Lumber. This is, hey, Al can see this, right? That, um, you, obviously, you see the, uh, the white is the. Um, the fiberglass, uh, and then you see the mineral fiber in the two. That is the same square footage of insulation, right? So obviously it's not the same cubic feet in the package, but this is, what would you say, four times? Four times as dense as this. And you can feel the weight difference. You guys can just feel the weight difference, right? The mineral, mineral wool and the, and the and this is this is larger than this. you can feel the, the significance. Is you know density is the key to the sound attenuation, right? The sound is absorbed density. So we know that, um, and this is just a, just an amazing photograph. This this is just a little bit more expensive to buy these two than that than that. Something's weird there. I mean, per pound. This is three times as expensive, the fiberglass, as the rock one, per pound. <laughs> I have the biggest kick out of that. That is just too much. I have no idea why. One of the reasons not to use rock wool is right up in the picture. If you're an insulation contractor, how big is your truck got to be? <laughs> to get all that stuff and that, there's a significant difference in volume. So the importance of uh, acoustic comfort, which is a cool term, right? Um, fiberglass has, quote, insignificant impact on acoustic attenuation, according to Google. So you guys have to verify all this stuff, right? Well, that's a Google poll. Uh, comfort bat is a known uh, uh, sound attenuation. Uh, if you look up uh, insulation, acoustical insulation, uh, it, it's mineral fiber. Johns Mansville makes an acoustic acoustic insulation, right, for interior walls, because it doesn't matter for them. So guess what that stuff does? Mineral fiber. Johns Mansville, like, makes a you know, huge fiberglass company. They don't make a exterior wall insulation. They make an interior wall acoustic insulation. So is Rockwell, by the way, called Vape and Sound. I wouldn't bother with it. It's just use this stuff. It doesn't make any sense. I, I explored it. I've I got no reason. It's more expensive. Okay, here's another concept unrelated to um, to my preference, my vast preference for for bad insulation. Now we're going to get it. We're now getting into like how do you specify uh high performance insulation on a more conceptual level so this concept is our value is not what we think it is we think when we when we specify a two by four wall 
in R13, uh, uh, final isolation. Now we're getting an R13 wall, but we're not getting an R13 wall because our, our wherever we have wood frame, which is a lot, right? It's like 20, 15, you know, depends, 12 to 18 percent of that wall is solid lumber. And that has an R value of like two. I mean, it's, you know, it's like it's a conductive material more than it is an insulated material. So our overall performance of our two by four wall with our R13, this is our 15, 15% 15 higher R value. So boy, the, the, the cost the cost difference is really per per R value is really good. Um, this R13 wall with, with fiberglass insulation, and this is our conventional wall. Our, our, our was it 19, two by six wall? Our 19, five and a half inches. Um, that's that our, our, our 19 wall is more like an R14, 13, and our, our 13 insulated wall is more like an R9. That's not very hot, right? So we, we, and now in the Bay Area, we're spoiled. We can get away with it. It's no big deal, really. It is. <laughs> we aren't like it, it. Really, isn't that big a deal? Uh, although this winter, um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of proving us wrong a little bit about that. We we're talking. We're probably talking about you know a five, three to five hundred dollar a year cost savings if we go to a, a better system. Uh, so it's it, but it has all kinds of other. Um, uh, high performance insulation has lots of different. We already talked about one, right? We talked about unintended consequences, right? Dry, huge thing. There, there are other, there are other issues. So, so we have to think beyond our value. I guess that's what I'm. If we're going to do high performance wood frame construction, we have to think beyond our value. We have to think the untitled twenty four, which is in love with our value. And we have to think about the concept of thermal bridging and the importance of uh, thermal break. Um, we talked about in the last slide how wherever there's wood, we don't have our R13, right? We, we have basically what this, what this slide is showing is we have thermal bridging at all the wood, at all the wood frame. So, if I'm if I've got a wall, if this is an exterior wall, and I've got R13 in it, wherever there's a stud, it's R1 or two, and we're losing energy through through the interior space through the wall at a much more rapid, you know, in the, in the winter or more so, uh, rapid uh, pace than than we're than in the middle of the wall. So one of the things we want to do in in high performance insulation is we want to cut the thermal bridge. Right? Um, so we'll talk a, more about that at the end where I'll show you the way we do it in our firm. It's very inexpensive and very easy to do to use this stuff. So don't let me forget. And we, we, we use this stuff on the interior side of the exterior wall. Um, we can have a whole whole separate conversation about that stuff. So related to to rigid insulation, this stuff uh, related to the rigid insulation uh, conversation is that this stuff is foamular or whatever they call it, N -X -N -X -P in it. next generation NGX next generation X is formula. So this stuff is made uh, with a blowing agent uh, called HF12 rather than hydrofluoroform or whatever, H, 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 HFC, thank you, rather than HFC, uh, which is a, a, a real breakthrough in the manufacturing of all foams, including uh, closed cell, uh, closed cell spray foam and, and this stuff, which is also a closed cell rigid foam insulation. With closed cells, the water can't get through it. And this also constitutes a water uh, a vapor, uh, a vapor retarder, vapor barrier. 
qualifies as an ultra high performance installation. Understanding laws is important as concept nine, staying, staying, staying abreast of the kinds of things that are going on. You know, if you, a lot of people will tell you, oh, forget your insulation, that stuff, the blowing agents they use and that stuff is brutal. Well, it's true, but literally two years ago, this is brand new. Uh, HFLs are brand new. Honeywell makes it and one other company makes it and it's a breakthrough. Breakthrough in chemistry. There's a 99.9% .9 reduction in what's called GWP or global warming potential. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, Title 24 regulations can't solve our problems. I love this little cartoon. Ever since I started wearing a shy, I really can't figure these things out. So Title 24 is like really like dumbed down version of energy, energy efficiency. It's, Really, really good. And then sadly, what what, what we in uh, architecture and, and construction uh, just take Title 24 as well. It only Title 24, Title 24 is good. So really poor. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, it can't even take, and I would laugh at this, but when you think of thermal bridging, okay, let's, 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 uh, I don't really have metal. Your metal chair? Everything's hot in here because the room is over warm. But when you when you go home, and, you know, everyone knows this from experience. You touch a piece of metal and you feel cold. And you just lift your hand and just break the contact on the material. Because you're getting thermal bridging, you're actually going to conduct it bridging, right? As soon as you break that by an eighth of an inch, it's a state change. So so that is a complete state change. When you when you take that when you take the uh, Egyptian wall board and you move it off the stud a quarter of an inch, you create this is a complete state change in the performance. Title twenty four has no ability to understand. It's just none of the program. It's way too complicated. I'm sure somebody can understand it, but my my uh, energy compliance guy has. We know it works, so we, we do it. Uh, and we do it more uh, from a principle based and, and a systems thinking uh, understanding than we do to, to meet Title 24 compliance. <laughs> so, if you're looking for Title 24 to teach you about high performance installation, it, 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 nothing's going to get wrong. Doesn't work out. There is one, one really solid systems approach to understanding how insulation fits in. Uh, so what, I, what I'm assert, asserting is you need to use a systems approach to understand how to select, how to think about insulation in a larger context and passive house. How many, how many of you know about, are familiar with passive house? My staff is not raising their hand. <laughs> second, second day. I've got days here. Um, really fantastic uh, European. I mean, they sort of stole our American ideas from the seventies for passive solar, and they, by necessity, improved on it because their temperatures are well. They could have done it. The class. But anyway, the Germans really sort of figured it out. And I'm not going to get into it, but you should you should know it. Um, uh, here's our here's our piece right here of thermal insulation. And here's our other piece of thermal bridge reduced design. So eliminate the thermal bridging. These are both really important. Air tightness is not a part of this conversation. That's another another conversation. Um, we are really not, most of our windows in the U.S. perform adequately, um, not like the European ones that we do, but, okay, so that's concept 12 to 11. And then concept 12 is similar, system thinking leads to better choices. So, so we have to understand the complexity of what we're, you know, the thing that we're trying to do. So this is why I started out with our mission. And we went through a bunch of details and we sort of come back to, you know, in order to solve these puzzles, we have to think in terms of systems. 
This is a little cheat sheet I put together for you. Um, it, it, everybody should have one of these. And it's on the up here. Um, so I have a performance category and then I'm comparing the two types of insulation you can get at Asculum. You cannot get a temp insulation at Asculum. Right. I mean, you can specify it for, for your cool project and, and get it. It's just not something that we're not. Uh, I have a hard, you know, I should tell you a little bit of my own experience. Um, I have a really hard time getting contractors to put minimal bypass. I mean, this has been a slog. It's one of the reasons I wanted to do this. So we have this tape and give it to me. <laughs> they will, um, one of the main things they do is they don't read the plan. They bid fiberglass and then they tell the owner, oh, no, it's going to be way, you know, they scare the owner and say it's going to be more expensive and I have to get into it. It's not more expensive and they've already bid it and that's up. So now we have our bid test. I mean, that's some of the things we're doing right now, putting, you know, don't bid, the, you know, here's the things you need to understand the project. Um, I had it pulled out of, I had it, uh, Pulled out of a project where it's a retrofit, where the house has no uh, waterproofing at all. I've had a, I had a recent, we have a recent project where there's no waterproofing. It's a retrofit, you know. So we we had to keep all the exterior. We couldn't afford. This is a an old his old Victorian. It's a affordable housing project. Couldn't afford to redo the exterior um, below uh, exterior siding. So it's the old exterior siding still on. Um, we're blowing in insulation into the cavity, he, and the contractor bid, even though we say mineral fiber, he bid blown in fiberglass. So he doesn't have a blowing machine that will blow in mineral fiber. There is a blown in mineral fiber that's available commercially. So we have to go through this, this, you know, this blog, and this is, hasn't been easy. So I say that because it's one of the reasons I'm having this talk is one of the specific things, there's really two specific things. To get you to use this and to get you to start employing uh, our, uh, uh, a technology and a strategy for uh, thermal breaks is very inexpensive. Question? Yeah, so in this list, how does uh, Ultratch compare to any of these? Or is it what is Ultratouch? The, the recycled the, denim. Recycle denim. Uh, I don't know. That's exactly what I was just talking about. Uh, I can't get ultra touch. Maybe you can get ultra touch. Three uh, times more expensive than twice as hard to get this all. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, uh, you need to repeat the question. I need to repeat the question. Our <laughs> friends to your right. To the out. Can we turn the out towards the person? <laughs> you want to say the question a little louder? How does the two columns compare to? Ultra touch recycle. So you're looking for another column, which would be ultra Just touch. one, maybe it made a difference, but you're the I, expert. I don't know. <laughs> That's the honest answer. I don't even bother with it. I, I used to put in denim insulation in hemp that 20 years ago. Yeah, I experimented yes. with everything because I wanted to. It was fun and go for it. Um, I wouldn't touch anything like denim because what? Anybody have an idea why? You don't have the numbers or it's trying to, difficult getting it through the so, department? Yeah, I don't, I can't tell the, you know, now I have to research where to find it. So that's one reason. There's organic base, there's dirt water, it's way more expensive. Both of them. There's water. And then now we're getting a performance and integrity. Uh, it's a it's a lot of support. And a lot of these things are like cellulose. There you go. Go ahead. But I, I, you, you're exactly right. It's three times as expensive, harder to install. I think in a perfect world where there's no water intrusion, actually, I haven't seen it in several years now, but for a while, it was an option that we were yeah, talking to clients about all the time. And sometimes they would, they would be like, oh, I didn't care about the cost. Yeah. But it was always a cost issue. Where were you getting it? Post insulated. Well, yeah. So I wouldn't touch. I mean, I don't. 
you know, the fact that this, this stuff, this stuff is, you know, hydrophobic, as you said, is a huge deal in wood frame construction and steel frame construction. It's a massive deal. If you're a building scientist, you understand the three Ds. But all three Ds are really important. All right, I have I have more questions. Frank up. <laughs> so Frank's over everybody. I, I, the thermal break, the thermal break, I get. What what we see is for sound, the sound break, we do either double layers of yeah. lock or RC channel on ceilings, yeah. not usually on walls, but now that we're talking sound. But if I've got a, an exterior frame wall, two by four or two by six, whatever insulation goes in there, if it's a sheer wall, then I've got plywood right on that, then my chip. So in order to create, well, I haven't gotten that thermal break, let me get there. Oh, okay, yeah, we got it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll get there. Here's here's how we get there. The pink, the pink. Thank you, Zach. The pink is this stuff. So what we do is we use a half an inch of what used to be really bad for the environment insulation, and is probably now on par with everything else. Uh, all of this has to be environmental impact. Sorry, none of this stuff is angel. Stuff, angel hair. Um, but this stuff, we use a half an inch of rigid insulation on the inside, on top of the plywood before the sheet. Okay. So I used to call this the poor, well, I call it the poor person's path of that. I did this on my own hat. And believe me, I'm as cost conscious as they come. I don't know. But I also want the highest performance. So I figured it out. I'm putting a layer, a half inch layer, actually on my. ABU, I put a quarter inch. Uh, this, this was seven years ago. Because I knew I only needed a quarter inch straight for the thermal. I just got the R stuff at Home Depot and stuff like four dollars for a four by eight sheet. Tacked it up there on top of my group of stuff. Put on that. Uh, put and then put on my put on my sheetrock, and something wild happened. the The plane is so well insulated and it's so comfortable because there's no thermal bridging. And we didn't really we didn't really get into this. It has a uh, really high. It's really well performing in what we call um, uh, average radiant temperature. So if this wall is a little cool and it's 70 degree air temperature, this wall is cool. I'm going to feel cold, right, at a at a higher air temperature. If this wall is not cold and it's set, I might feel comfortable at 68 degrees. So it has a real impact. So turns out in the ADU that has this thermal break, it's super comfortable at 68 degrees. That's really interesting. Is that just the notice in that in the house, which has no thermal bridging. We have just sort of, sort of standard wall construction. We would kind of like it at 72. So, you know, was, I, had direct, I had direct experience with, with uh, so that, you know, that doesn't show up in any of the Title 24. By the way, a half an inch of bridge insulation on the inside does all this wonderful, all, have all these wonderful magic tricks. Look at this condition. Condition that everyone, you know, look at this. Now I have, what do I have? A thermal blanket and a continuous thermal break. The entire room. That's pretty cool for like really cheap, super cheap. And this is this is my concrete stem wall, which today this is how we're building today, right? We everybody wants. I mean, if you don't want it, you should want it for for universal uh, universal design and access. This is on great construction. Uh, California building code super super lenient slab slab on grade on grade. You know, you have to have a four inch slab with you know number three V bar or eighteen inch. I mean, it, you could design it prescriptive with California building code for very light, um, very light system. Um, but you can see, I just bring the 
and sort of for co conversation for another day, um, I used this wonderful tape made by Owen Corning exactly for this reason. It's called Joint R Joint Steel R Tape. And what happens? What happens when I tape all this? And this is a vapor retarder. I'm a vapor man, so I know my impact. The only thing I have to worry about is, is my penetration. And, and like you tape them, and it's all, you know, there's, there's tons of options for that. Now. So, so now I've got, remember we talked about that two by eight, right? Well, since you know, we used to have to put two by 12, and we have to have, a, uh, we have to have our vent gap and all that stuff. I don't need any of that in because there's no, there's very little vapor getting up into that system. Not enough causing any damage. So, um, so, so I've given you, um, did I, I don't know if I printed that out, but everybody has access to this. This is our, basically our spec sheet. This is our general specification sheet for our whole Todd Jersey architecture, high performance insulation system. Now I've got other things in here because it's very hard just to separate it out. So I've got, We've got vapor barrier in there. We're showing how we do our vapor barrier. Uh, whoops. How we use a bentonite clay waterproofing and, va and vapor barrier system here. Because where do you where do you start with one high performance system and where do you stop? They're all interrelated. They're all systems. So we're starting on a, and this is the first, this is the first talk in a series of talks on high performance. Um, um, high, high performance building. Let's see. Let me see if, if I have. That's it. So, uh, so but, yeah. So, how do you keep somebody from putting can lights and light fixtures in your lid through the? Well, because that's going to let all that vapor. Yeah. Happen. So we have. Um, uh, I mean, we have so many great choices now that we didn't have even five years ago for putting can recycle lighting in in through a vapor. So Rachel makes a whole bunch of uh, boxes, of electric boxes now. There's a, a whole line of reset lights that just aren't reset anymore. It's LEDs. And well, LEDs are flat. <laughs> so it looks like a reset light. It's a flat LED. You know, with I mean, there's some really cheap ones, but there's some good ones though. They fit right into a J, which and then the J box is designed to seal around the. Uh, a vapor barrier. So it's really easy. And then you, you get your processors to pop. You do yeah. have a J box. Yeah, you have a pop is specified. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I think, I think the pop, I think formula, I can't remember. Oh, this is another, oh, by the way, this is, this is a fun, this, this is that tape, that, that joint tape. And this is Sigma, which is also a great product. And this is so sticky. I couldn't get the plastic. This stuff is amazing. <laughs> really just so you need this it's bomb proof. This, these are these are bomb proof systems. Um what else? What other questions do you have? Well, I noticed when you're so you're specifying the uh the rigid installation to be the uh thermal the, yeah, but to take the plate which is the channels. So, this, so instead of having separate material to space off the wall, you're using a that well the resilient the channel unless it's a thermally broken channel. Yeah, it doesn't it's got something. Yeah, it's not as good as this. Um also I am getting R so this stuff is R what is it R5 per inch. So I'm getting R2.5. Yeah, and I'm getting acoustic. And also, what happens is, oh, here's another thing that I, I hadn't mentioned. This relates to when you're thinking in systems. I have, um, we're able to get such a high performing uh, wall system now that we can use uh, electric resistance based for heating. Now, obviously, you don't use that if you need cooling. But for the people in, in Berkeley and in coastal areas, you know, fog related areas, cooling is still not, not, not essential to work with the use of HRV technology. 
uh, which is you know sort of another topic. Um, heat recovery ventilation technology. That's the stuff. What they call adequate ventilation strategy. That's the German. The German translating into English. Adequate ventilation. <laughs> That's high performance ventilation. This is uh, basically uh, heat recovery or energy recovery. They're describing energy recovery ventilation, which if you don't know about it, just Google it tonight. It's, it used to be very expensive. It's very inexpensive now. And it, uh, it is a essential piece of high performance wood frame construction, essential and very inexpensive equipment. So these are all these are the pieces. So we've basically addressed these two. There's another conversation, uh, and, and to some degree, air tightness, right? We did, right? Because we we talked about vapor. There's another conversation, really, about about our water barrier, which they're not getting into because this is more thermal related. Uh, and then um, and then that piece. Uh, yeah, uh, the stray foam that you showed mm -hmm. and you were suggesting that uh, that's also providing internal bridging. Is that is that correct? The, the spray foam, no, it, it is not. Unfortunately, the spray foam does not help us with the thermal bridging. Oh, okay. Right, it's it helps us with vapor control. So often in 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 our vaulted ceilings, what we've been doing is put up the framing. In order to take care of the condensation issue, the vapor issue in a vaulted ceiling without having to vent, we'll spray on a couple of inches or spray the whole thing, but usually put on an inch of both cell spray foam. And that takes care of con condensation. And you can achieve R30? Well, then, I, then we usually put mineral fiber in or have been putting it in because this stuff is so environmentally has been up till two years ago. So we'll probably well we don't use it anymore. So again, that goes between the because what we use now, yeah, what we do now is so we've gotten away from which is also expensive the spray foam insulation because we're using the um, we're using this as a vapor barrier. So this is just like within the last eight months I realized what a minute, this stuff is closed cell. Is the building department accepting that? Yeah, it's all accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's a it's a closed cell system and it's a vapor retarder. You show them the continu continuous. So as long as it's on the inside, doesn't matter where it is. Right, it's on the warm side. Right. Mm -hmm. So so vapor can't get through this. If you're up if you're up here, we were putting the the vapor the uh, the the spray foam up up against the roof plant. Right to keep the basically keep the vapor laden air from getting getting up to the fiber, getting up to the uh, the, the dew point. Never to get to the dew point and never condense it up against the fiber. What you are doing? Do you make your builders lower or test that to make sure it's not? Happening? We don't blow blow door test because we don't really, because we don't really have to because we're in Berkeley. If we were in Chicago, we. We need to be blow door and testing anything in the house. But it's not inexpensive. I'm not I'm opposed to it. We can put it up, but most owners aren't, aren't interested. And my, if I was doing my house, I would do it because I was talking about. But this thing is going to be, these things are going to be pretty tight. Um, the reason I think the, the blower door now would be to make sure that we're not getting vapor leakage if we're not going to. Uh, if we're not going to rely on, uh, we're not going to rely on our on our uh, spray foam. We're eliminating spray foam, which is expensive. That's another nice thing about this system. You know, spray foam is not cheap. And 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 by the way, this H H O O or whatever this thing is made it more expensive. Other questions? Let's see what we're going to get. Okay, yeah. The reason you put that uh, that foam on the inside is so you can get continuous versus on the outside. Yeah, we don't want to want your big barrier we want to go on the water side of the wall. But the reason I did it initially was because um I had I was retrofitting a garage building 
which I had built 10 years ago into the Navy U. And uh, I carried a wall, wall of brick. I didn't want to go inside anyhow. So I just, I just, uh, I put it on the inside. It, we we also use um, kind of also re also related to this conversation is um, a high performance stucco system called a one club stucco system. It's, it's Omega makes it. Other people make it. Um, it uses um, it's called a one coat. It's actually two coats. Is it like uh, driving? Mm -hmm. Is it like driving? Yeah. They're similar. So um, a primer coat and then a finish coat. The, yeah, driving it. Uh, the one coat system is actually uses a stucco. It's a three eight stucco. They put on, but the the initial. So you've got your exterior plywood. So the siding system works. Exterior plywood, half an inch of rigid insulation, which we would use this stuff on the outside. On the outside, and that becomes basically your your grass coat, right? Brown grass, brown yeah. Grass. That becomes your scratch coat. So that replaces the half an inch of stucco that the stucco contractor would typically put. Is well, it that material or is it, are you using something? No, it's this, group? this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you can specify this. Um, they they all take any foam, right? So half an inch on top of your ply and then you're- and Then you're putting, uh, then you're putting your lap on. Uh, you put your waterproofing on first and then this stuff. This stuff is applied. Um, oh, wait a minute. So then this yeah, where is it? Uh, so then this wait, qualifies. Wait, wait. Like, that's not where the get it. Yeah. That's not, no, this is not water. This is the vapor barrier on the inside. So you're saying you're putting on your waterproofing and then that material? Or I'll always you put your waterproofing on your plywood unless you're crazy. Yeah. And you're drying your, your drainage mat. You can get this stuff with, with grooves in the back. To allow for drainage. Remember building science, right? And doesn't that ruin the efficiency of the insulative effect of it? Because now you're venting the back side of the insulation. No, no. I mean, when we're also not, I'm not really asking the exterior siding to do a lot of insulating. I'm, I am asking it to do thermal, thermal break. But even in our system, we're not even asking it to do a thermal break. We were already done with thermal break. So this is just extra. We usually use a high performance stucco system for other reasons. Uh, although it does have amazing, you know, if you're not going to do the interior thermal break, then definitely would recommend the one coat uh, stucco system, which has, which is a thermally broken uh, siding, which is high performance. That, 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 you know, this is where, you know, talk about system thinking. Is a one cup system insulation? Yeah, the insulated, you know, uh, uh, siding, which is what uh, what's the acronym for driving again? Insulated finishes. Aegis. Aegis, right? Insulated. Good question. Um, can you explain a little bit more about your reasoning for using the one cup would be appropriate in this climate? No, it's not essential. Okay. But we're really mostly. I mean, if you go into building science and literature right now and talk, and, and there's a wide variety, of there's a lot of debate about what a vapor, you know, what vapor retires do, are they important in a climate like ours? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two good reasons. Bathrooms, kitchens, that's two. Third good reason, fault of And bedrooms, not necessary, but then again, you know, I mean, maybe maybe somebody got a humidifier in there. I, I just assume have it. I don't see any. Um, you know, there are debates that we want to have internal drying. Uh, so you got you can sort of decide that for yourself. I did the the internal. Really, literally did this this. Uh, as a thermal break, because I know enough about, um, I wanted a higher performing, uh, why did I do this? I wanted a higher performing wall. It wasn't for Title 24. Oh, it's just because the path to that. I wanted continuous insulation. What path to that? I'll see. So I had studied up on path to path. 
which was about 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, and I had sort of loaned up finally that path of path system thinking and thought I should have, you know, I'm a green architect, I should have um, CI. So how do I get a CI? I already got my wall, exterior wall. Because in passive house, all your CI is on the exterior. They build the wall, they put the, the, the and then they put foam on the outside and that's a continuous insulation. And then you've got your side on top of that. So nobody has that. And so I, I didn't have that luxury. By the way, how wonderful is, it, is this system? Because half the remodels we do, we, we don't have access to the exterior wall. So the only way we can do CI anyway is on the interior. We're like 50% of our project, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it, it's, it's a kind of a breakthrough. I think it's a, really one of our breakthrough ideas in, in our firm. We've had about maybe eight to 10 of them. Uh, we were one of the first firms to commercially to use biofuel technology, uh, which is now California law. And we've been advocating for electrification of, of units, and this is where the, the uh, electrical spaceport comes in. 15 years ago, I asked my Title 24, why can't we use, if we're doing a really good job of insulation, why can't we just use spaceport electrical heat? Because it's so cheap and it's so controlled. And we did the numbers. Yeah, we added like, we just added like an inch and a half of, we went from a half an inch on the exterior insulation for the EFAS to an inch and a half, and that was it. So it was really easy. It was like, okay, now we now we saved $700,000 on the game. So this is how all of these, these, these things sort of, oh, by the way, the bioswale that I used back in the very first Lee Gold hotel in the world, uh, that bioswell enabled us to drain our parking lot, storm water, and do our, what we call winter ponds back then. I just call them winter ponds. I didn't know what else to call them. <laughs> but winter ponds, I hired a hydrologist. He said, yeah, you can do it. And, um, and we did it. And the contractor came back and said, well, you just saved $750,000. Because we don't have to put in any of the drain boxes for the and guess what? We don't have to we don't have to dig in and connect to the city storm system. And the biggest thing, we don't have to pay this fee to connect to the storm system. It's like quarter million dollars. So that was cool. That paid for all the other stuff. That's when we got these goals. <laughs> on a on a commercial building, a hotel, like a three-star hotel. Have you ever worked with a hotel? Uh, developers. I mean, these are well, all developers are cheap in that, and they, and they pay for them. really cheap. This guy wanted to leave gold. I want leave gold, and I'm you know I'm asking him like, what's your budget? I think he's at 170 dollars a square foot. <laughs> you know, what other questions? Second question. Yeah. Are you exploring the uh, insulated wall space? Oh, on the on this guy? Yeah, instead of yeah, um, I'm a big anti crawl space person at this point because there's so much debate about you know insulating it, venting it. I've always been on the, the idea that venting venting crawl space has never made any sense to me. Um, I don't think we need to vent crawl spaces, but then the code says you have to vent crawl spaces, or you have to mechanically vent them, or you have to insulate. So we we uh, mostly vent and just call it a day. Just vent them. Uh, but ninety percent of our new construction is is because of universal design. Is uh, well, the small stuff, the larger stuff. If it's on a hill, we're definitely doing the crawl space. But um, because of universal design, we want people to be able to. So, uh, you know, in aging and planning, we need a lot of ADU. Um, you're going to age in place, you want to be able to, you know, run a wheelchair in and around your house and, and not have barriers. Barrier free design is an important thing. How all of these things relate to everything else. One of, and, and one of the reasons I started doing 
um, in, uh, the rigid on the inside on our TGA projects, not just on our houses because of that condition. I realized, oh, wow, how nice is that? I'm just running my, running my, I'm just using my rigid insulation right over my concrete. How does that work with the uh, insulated uh, hydronic floor heating? Well, the, the hydronic floor heating would not have rigid insulation at the top. You insulate the outside of the wall, right? Uh, how do I do hydronic? Usually we actually, actually what we usually do, 50% 50, 50 of the time, we do do this. And we put a radiant slab on top of that. Yeah, that's a, by far the best way to do it. Yeah, we would, we would, have, a, we would have the structural slab yeah. and then a rigid yeah. insulation break. Yeah. And then whatever three or four inches of oh, exactly. topping slab with the with the radian with the radian in it. So there's got to be a thermal break, otherwise he's just yeah. Well, like you're not really looking at the leg now. Yeah, I mean the typical way we were doing it for years was, as you were mentioning, is to insulate here, but then you have a really big, really big uh, delay. Um, you know, you're trying to heat up your house, you're heating the whole ground. Yeah. Is there a product that, let's just say, instead of putting a half inch piece of closed cell foam on yeah. the interior side of the studs, is can you get some sort of, let's say, rubberized tape that just goes over the stud where the sheet rock would normally attach? And then, and then, is there are other thermal breaks? Yeah, because that's all you're looking for. Absolutely. Is Absolutely. Break so thinking. As the gentleman between systems thinking, right? It's like, oh, what are we trying to do here? Because instead of having a wall of close up foam, yeah, you, know, you just have yeah. someone who, yeah. you know, lack of skill, you just use the you, uh, can, you can do a thermal thermal adhesive. Thermal. That's right. You can do a thermal thermal. break. I just found this to be the cheapest, easiest way. And I am getting right. that R2.5. It turns out that we do have to pass level 24. It turns out that R2.5 is like make or break. <laughs> For <laughs> no way for compliance, you know, so so that's what you know, and it makes a difference. And but if you have your R15 in the wall, let's say with mineral fiber, right? Yeah, then you don't really need that extra. I still need it, to, it depends. Yeah, you so if I'm trying to, to, if I'm trying to get to a level of performance where I can qualify for Title 24 and use a very inefficient, uh, based electric baseboard. Right, we know that electric baseboard is allowable under Title 24 under the uh, under the performance um, uh, the performance whatever the performance criterion. It's not prescriptive. It's not allowed in the prescriptive, but performance wise, if you increase your performance of your wall, you can you can yeah, you can use the, the, the low performing electrical baseboard heat. So we have to increase our performance of our wall over sort of conventional. So one of the ways we do that is, is, is with this. Can you use that tape? That no, tape this tape is not a thermal. Not enough. No. You said yeah, yeah. eighth of an inch or greater. Yeah, I mean, I use the quarter of an inch. That's about as little as I would want to use. Um, but you could use other things. You know, you could use spacers and all, I mean, you could, Think yeah, like foam or that. Think outside the foam. box. The box you could probably you could control a, a, a tube of you know <laughs> you could put that on there. And, but this stuff is I don't know. I mean, I mean you'll find this stuff is so easy to work with. It's super light, um, super light. It's not cheap, but you know per dollar per performance for Frank's project is chunk change. It's nothing. I mean, if you're trying to do an ADU for three hundred dollars, just put an ADU for three hundred dollars. We are doing high level, high performance construction at three hundred dollars a square foot. It's it's possible. It's it's frankly it's really too expensive. But we well, you know, Frank wanted that contract. We don't have we don't want to ask. Um, but we're able to do it. We you know with with the with the crew of contractors that are that we teach and that are eager to go to work with us. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. I mean we're we're talking energy bills here. 
But first of all, you know, here's another thing, you know, great unintended consequence. Your, your PV system is sideways down down. Because you're, you know, your your demand, and we can we can size all this. We we have our title 24 guys, really a performance person like we are. So they're really interested in holistic. So they we talk with them about the whole the whole system. They'll give us, you know, electrical loads, how how we you know what what size if we do this, can we go from uh this size of a split system down to a smaller split system? We just have all these kinds of conversations. We're really interested in if you are a client, we want you, we want to give you the highest performing project for the lowest cost. We want to brag about it, just like I am. Yeah. I want to be able to brag about it. I want to, and I also want to duplicate it. And I want to be able to duplicate this with, with all of our clients. We're working for nonprofits now. We're, Martina and I are working on a project uh, for YEP, um, uh, Youth Employment Partnership. By the way, who read money? That's all. Um, it's a dormitory for that. Uh, Youth, young adults that are in, in this employment employment training program. Part of being an employment training program is uh, you have to be enrolled at Lady College. These young adults can't afford to go to school and, and at Lady College and also pay rent. So living out of cost. So youth employment partnership is building a dormitory. And we're we're the architecture of this dormitory. And this is sort of an idea I came up with and pitched about 10 years ago. And uh, I'm very into collaborative living. I think the collaborative living is are you know super, super crucial. So so we're we're getting to build things, which is really great. We're using all this stuff. Yeah, all this stuff. And guess what? For uh for all the rooms, the heated. Look at what is our heat source. This is what we should have a picture. It's an electric based port heater. It's this long. It's tiny. It's like absurdly small. Is the CDC sort of a, trying to abolish it, but yet local building codes are kind of usurping? No, no. As long as you, you know, the, 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 you can't fit it under the prescriptive mode, but, it, but uh, there are some cities that do not allow the technology at all. But California, Energy code resident allows it under the prescriptive approach. Prescriptive mm -hmm. or what's the profile of that electric base? Is it like the old style ones? Oh, yeah, it's dorky looking thing. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's like $50 each. And this is a, this dorm has like 30 rooms. It's, a, it's very complicated. So try to put a split, you know, the split. Back to that, a minor guess, five hundred million, uh, five hundred thousand dollars. Isn't it an so, issue when someone puts something in front of it in their dorm? You mean a fire issue? Yeah. No, no. If that was a fire issue with these things. They'd all be out of business long ago. It, uh, whatever the element is, is protected within uh -huh. within it. It's no more dangerous than the stuff that you that you plug into the wall. You'd have to work. Like a space heater? Yeah, that's what they are. They're wall mounted space heaters. And they're just hardwired. So there, yeah, there is an issue, uh, I guess, with the there's I mean these 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 rooms are so well insulated that the body itself, these aren't even hardly needed. Well, you can design that way. We can design that way. I mean, we used to build places and yeah. rely on the light bulbs, the refrigerators, <laughs> that. Um, and then absolutely LED bulbs to part of that. Absolutely. Unfortunately, Final Point Four will not do that. You, everything has to have a heat source, mm -hmm. yeah. and they won't allow bulbs. But yes, I mean, if it wasn't for Title Twenty Four, there is room in, in that building we would not have simply no need. Uh, but it's really comical. How how little money is spent on this in the heat? Like sixty dollars each times thirty. What's six times thirty? Twenty. One hundred. Sixty times thirty. Eighteen hundred. Eighteen hundred bucks. Okay. Less than two thousand dollars. And these things really are hardwired. I mean, this is easy stuff. 
So a hundred dollars each. I'm <laughs> putting it up. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a third step. So let's give it two hundred dollars. So you see, under ten thousand dollars. We heated an enormous building with with thirty steps. That is a staggeringly low number. So all of this. So this is this, this is systems thinking at its best. Thinking about insulation has wonderful, one of these wonderful consequences in performance, saving money. Guess what? Each one of these residents now has a little thermostat. It'd be very expensive to put a thermostat in. So you'd be talking about a 30 zone in each room, right? Okay, if we have if we had a conventional, that's that'd be that's a million dollars. We have a two thousand dollars system. Each one of these little dorky things has a thermostat in the room. It's tiny. It's big. It's literally that big because we don't. That's all we needed. That's all the cal can count out because we did the thermal. We did the thermal break and thermal insulation, and, and we were using the performance uh, aspects. And we were smart enough to ask the questions and interesting enough, interested enough. To ask. Questions. Otherwise, our client would be putting in a million dollar HVAC system, by the way, which would also have all kinds of emissioning issues. A, a system in a small building that complex, kids are going to be too cold, too hot, constant maintenance. Think about it. It's like a hotel where you don't have a third step. And you just got to live with it. You know? So this is all an entire proportion. As a system, the, the, what we what we designed for the YEP project as a system, way higher performance than a conventional at a small fraction of the cost. We use the really good examples of systems thinking and relate to the insulation company. I I, 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 just happen to say, <laughs> I just happened to say at a small renovated hotel this past weekend. And so and there must have been 30. I, I'm gonna guess there were yeah. 30 rooms. And it's Sonder. So it, it's a it's a room. I mean, the shower is literally in the room. There's nothing yeah. else there. It's been in the shower. And but there's a thermostat. I didn't pay any attention to it until we we're talking. There's a thermostat and a little heater up on the wall. So you don't put anything in front of it. You can't have a kid leaning. Something in front of it, it's it's up on the wall, and and, and I'm gonna guess they were more than sixty bucks for the whole thing. Sure, the heater's not blowing air. No, it's yeah, just, and it, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's more than sixty bucks, but that's, that's more than sixty bucks. bucks. But it heated them, but they, they have to. Each individual room is yeah. got to have its own half to have. Them. So it's not some crazy. I'm yeah. sure it was way less expensive than some some okay. by a by a fact. Yeah, it's a lot. We have way <laughs> yeah. Are we sacrificing long-term cost efficiency with short-term expenditure? Mm -hmm. Because uh, electrical radiance, uh, electrical radiant resistant heating is a COP of one, and all the heat pumps are at COPs of three plus. We're not using electrical resistant heating. That's what you're talking about. These little things. We install like resistance. They're hardly ever going on. That's the difference. But you could. Build the but in the heat, the heat pump is completely out of the question. It's too expensive. So now we're we're at you know a as affordable conventional system as we can afford. Right. This is a this is a super low budget. I mean, I think they're doing this project for oh god, like two hundred fifty dollars a square foot. What are you What are you doing for the air circulation? Then? Great question. Who can answer that, Martina? Yes. <laughs> we're using a, we're using probably one of the first commercial home building residential heat recovery ventilation systems that I know about. So that's where we're spending our money. So we're spending our money to um, you know let's say half a million we save, um, hundred and something one, hundred and ten or something like that. went to a whole house. Heat recovery ventilation system. So each one of those 30 rooms, storm rooms, has their own little heat and has 
constant fresh air. The little bit and it's blowing this wonderful pre-warm fresh air into the room. You don't have to open and close the windows. Takes care. By the way, there's a HEPA filter on this thing. <laughs> this is a really, I'm glad you asked this question. This is a really extraordinarily high level of function and performance. Extraordinary. I mean, we should be winning like 50 awards. <laughs> but we're not because we're going to take too much time. But it really is. It's, a, it's an extraordinarily high level of function for, for the cost. I mean, it's a, it's a lead platinum level level of function for like 200 dollars square foot because we care and we thought enough about it and all these things lead to other things and we think about it and you know i studied uh passive house and applied the the, the passive house and the building science principles to uh, a project that i came to you know this is a really cool project and these people are doing amazing you know we're we're taking 30 people, 30 young adults out of their vehicle. And where, putting, where is it located? Okay. It's in Oakland. Um East 15. East 15. You know, it's in a it's in like a, it's a part of the mm -hmm. It's a part of of international, it's 15 and it's about the internet. Yeah. Miller. Uh -huh. Miller. Yeah. Yeah. Miller. yeah. And it's from the ground up. No, we took over. A, we took actually took an existing dorm that was originally built as a mortuary, funeral home, mortuary, funeral home, yeah. a funeral home. Uh, in the twenties, it's just really fun, funky. I don't know what is it, Moorish, Spanish style building. Um, and then somewhere around the fifties, it was taken over by the United Way for half of them. So it's this weird, funky. Um, Dorm, luckily, because we didn't have a change in use. So we just went from one dorm to another, and so that was your construction. How many of you are in construction? How about architecture and development? What am I missing? Realtors? Any builders out there? Realtors? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're architects here, you're about to real <laughs> Yeah, that's great. That's great. What else? Did you learn a lot? Yeah. You know, what you're talking about with this, you know, you know high performance ventilation and that, going, you know, you said it's a day I've heard this about 115 years ago. Yeah. And since then, I mean, ask my MEP is okay, we do that. <laughs> no, the answer 100% no. is no, no, every time. That's that. So, how do you convince your MEP? Don't ask. <laughs> MEP, you know, then this ties, this ties. So, the question is um, the gentleman's question is every time he asks, every time he asks the mechanical engineers if he can use electric resistance heating in his projects, they say no. And I he said, well, well, how do you deal with it? I said, I don't ask him. <laughs> you know, what, what this comes down to is that there's in the building, in, in the context of the building and design, the, the profession, the people who are the least adept at systems thinking are engineers. They just, it's just so hard for engineers to think out of linear thinking and so a lot of them go no, and they, and and unfortunately, most of the building trades are, are also, you know, like I said, I'm a really hard time that builders getting this stuff in. Also, incredibly conservative, and, and the tendency is to do the same thing all over and over again. So, you know, I mean, if I talk to our our high performance person, I think two months ago about how do how do we get rid of Rich insight, and I've been researching how to get rid of this stuff for like over a year, thinking about I hate you know because of the old blowing agents. Well, I just found out in pre preparing for this talk that there was a breakthrough two years ago. I didn't know. <laughs> so you know these things really matter. These things really make a difference, and and you know kudos to all of you for being here.
So that over why mineral fiber does not create the same water absorption as fiberglass. Why it doesn't? As far as I know, um, what I what I read, what Google told me, is that the fibers don't absorb water. But I don't think that's correct. It's covered in paraffin. I don't think it's covered in paraffin. I don't think either of these fibers absorb water. But there's something that happens. Um, so the nature of hydro hydrophilic to you know, hydrophobic is in a, in a hydrophilic situation. The water molecule is more attracted to material than it is to itself. It's abandoning its people for this. And a hydrophobic, the opposite. So there's something, and I don't really know why, but the proof's in the pudding. If you you can come up after this, we can take a little bit of water and we can put it on this. And you can see the other thing we didn't really talk about is like going through all of the, the cheat sheets. Um, you know, one of the things this does that, that mineral fiber doesn't do is deform over time. So this stuff is super, super stable. I I took the wall out, uh, I had this stuff in for 15 years in my garage, and it looked exactly the same after 15 years. I mean, there was absolutely no difference. I took a piece of this out of a project. Um, this is our project in um in Oakland. Different condition, attic, really rough, really rough condition. But it went from three and a half, I think, uh, maybe that much was left. It looked like this. And this was totally black. That's what it looked like, right? So, so it was completely degraded. But it was, it was three and a half inch insulation at one point. <laughs> you know, it said it in a way, it still said it in the paper. And, that, and it's acceptable as a fire water. What? The mineral. This is the, this doesn't burn. This stuff, thank you for mentioning that. That's like, you know, we just ran across that in an ADU, right? And the, the inspector said, you're going to use mineral pool, right? And it was an option I had given. And so they were like, yeah, sure, we use it. Yeah. It cost a little more. This the stuff you use, they use in just in just industrial around furnaces. To keep people from, you know, like I'm an employee and I'm working at a furnace and I'm going to keep my place from losing their hands. That's where the quiz became the floor of that curve. Yeah, right. This guy is the bomb. I mean, this is a high performance product. This is this is garbage. I never want to see you have any of this. You can <laughs> yeah. ever again. I'm so sorry. I've used it on so many times. <laughs> Last week. <laughs> I keep looking at the right. Damn. <laughs> I, you know, and I think we all have. I have it in my house. Well, unfortunately, it didn't go in the house 20 years ago. I didn't even know this stuff existed, but yeah, it did exist. You could get this. Well, we used to use it for a food stick. Yeah. The never turned out to be rent. Right. Yeah. And, then, and if you look at the John Manville, you know, this is this is a fire for, for and for some reason uh Rockwell makes a product called Safe and Sound, which they market for sound attenuation in the internal walls. So they want to they want you to buy it to put in this wall here at the tree as a fire retardant and, and acoustic wall, safe and sound, right? Uh, I don't know why. It's more expensive than higher than because it has that name on it. Less dense, higher density, so it's a better sound attenuator. Less than the weight, your weight, higher density, lower R value because it's got higher conductivity but lower convection resistance. So uh, it's a better sound attenuator, but it's not as good at insulation. So you don't use it on any job. There's your answer. Yeah. I'm skeptical of all that, but I would just use this because, you know. I mean, one of the things I, I was a builder before I went to architecture school, so I'm I'm really sensitive to what kind of stuff builders can't stand, and just asking them to put a different, unless you there's a really good reason. This is really good sound attenuation and incredibly good for fire safety. I think it's a marketing gimmick on their part, but you know, so you know you got to think about these kinds of things. Where where do you buy it? You know, I have to check with Drew and White. Do you even sell this thing? Yeah, it is. I'm going to get it at Drew and White and get it at Old Depot. 
Yeah, because you got to go to like specific supply. You got to go to specific supply. They only sell the two, the inch and a half. So, you know, there are issues with that. Um, and that that's one of the reasons I'm tempted to, because I want it to be in there. And it's so easy for the contractors to not call me and just, I couldn't find it. So, what am I going to say? Couldn't find it. Well, you don't look hard. Tell them to spend a little more time. Yeah, but it's hard for me to it's hard for me to say that because then then I get on the bad side and then things really get stuck. So I kind of do my homework and help them out. Right. So I wanted I wanted all to work. So but you know sometimes they don't help themselves. I mean we 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 have a project in uh, that Rich is working on in uh, in Alameda. It's got there's there's absolutely you know, it's an old stucco wall. This is an 18, 18 late eighteen hundred mansion. There is no water treatment outside. You know it's it's sheathing, right? It's uh, board sheathing. There's torus gaps in between the sheathing. There's no waterproofing at all. No paper. And it's got stucco, which is a which is a, like an absorb you know stucco absorbs water. And they they put in. I invited the contractor here. Uh, <laughs> Frank, you would never do this. And they put in, not after the day. No, 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 no. They put this stuff in. And I didn't catch it because it looked too much like this damn stuff. And then <laughs> the people were like, wait a minute. <laughs> and so, you know. He'd already had it in. He, they convinced the owner it wasn't a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. You guys can come and take a little piece of this home with you. Take a little piece <laughs> of this home with you. Try it. And put it in a little bowl of water <laughs> and have fun. Frank, you gotta do this. I mean, it's a, you will never you, know, you do this and you will never use this again. Ever. And you'll tell your friend, well, oh, I got news for you. I keep, I keep editorializing, and I don't mean to, but oh, um, whether 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 a project's got a, a little budget or a big budget really doesn't matter. Insulation is not something that the client thinks about unless somebody, the design professional architect, or if I bring it up. And whether if it's a negotiated project, that's one thing, but usually there's someone else they're talking to. So if I've got a category that seems like an outlier, like it's so fiberglass insulation becomes the norm, but I do have a line in every proposal that I say there are options for other usually more expensive insulation and we can talk to our sub at the time. And then I say to them, you know, we can use mineral wool or blue jean stuff in the past. We, have, we do a lot of foam yeah. in ceilings and stuff yeah. like that. And, yeah. you know, once I'm working with a client, you know, it's like, okay, it costs this yeah. much more. They usually say yes, but if it's not in the title 24, the architect's yeah. not saying yeah. Well, the yeah. architect is in stuff about Then they're getting all, yeah. then they're getting fiberglass yeah. and that's the end of it. So, I mean, you, you can yeah. interview. Yeah. You can intervene on that in that now. Yeah. Now that you know no, now that because as a building professional, your liability is up is in there. And you know, if you got mold and you know, it's a mold chain. Uh, but we have a project, we have a couple projects that have no overhang. You're putting stuck on a wall, no overhang. You're putting fiberglass in, in for it. In 20 years, you're gonna have issues. You, you just will. Also, oh, but that, but that doesn't relate to. Sorry, I'll get to you. If you've done conventional stucco, if you have a, a, a bulletproof stucco system with drainage and you do our high performance stucco system, which is another conversation, you're fine. But but most contracts aren't doing it. They're putting in these conventional stucco systems and it's with no overhang, with fiberglass, 20 years max. You see, you see up and down in Hanbo, you see, you know, Patrick Kennedy's, all of them, every single one of them. Every single Patrick Kennedy, he sold most of them right out about 20 years. Okay. He got rid of them. And then you see the scaffolding going up. Every single Patrick Kennedy, because he doesn't care. And the, the architects don't care. And I invited a bunch of architects. Who's, who's the architect again? Architect. Architect, thank you for being here. 
Thank you, Dr. These are my staff. They have to be. <laughs> <laughs> any, any last questions? Well, no, it's just a oh, yeah. point that concerns that. Um, also, this is the mineral wall is going to hold up better over time. Yeah. And insulation is going in usually to places that yeah. are never going to get a productiveness. Yeah. Future evolved yeah. or something. So nothing's worse than opening up the wall 10, 20 years yeah. later and there's nothing left in there. It's either nothing left or it's even worse. Yeah. It's that picture we showed. So if you can sell them all yeah. back, that this is going to hold up over time, which means it's going to still be performing as an insulator. Well, what was happening? Yeah. What was happening in the attic industry was that this was literally burning. In the paper room, it was so hot. I mean, you know, it's too hot for this stuff is made for this. This is why they made it. So there might be, I don't know, if there would be any degradation at all. I mean, they have you know rock will famously like the building show had a propane mm -hmm. flame sitting on the thing for like the whole day. I mean, it's weird. <laughs> I mean, it's like it looks fine. It gets red and it's like ah, no big deal. This stuff actually I I, I tried this. This stuff was lights on fire. <laughs> it doesn't burn by itself, right? It's not gonna, but it'll light on fire. It'll flame up like red. I don't know, you know, red is a terrible fire. You can burn it, but it doesn't burn by itself. Uh, that's the same thing here. This stuff is so funny that you have that like the whole concept, the same damn piece. All right, you guys, that was fun. <laughs>